And for the record, my name is Jeffrey Wallen, and I am the director of the Vermont Crime Information Center uh, with the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and what I want to do today is provide a little bit of information uh, and then really answer any questions, particularly from a technical or operational perspective about how expungements work at the criminal history record level. That's really what I want to be able to hopefully do today and answer any questions. And uh, uh, then um, if the commissioner, when he joins us, if there's any additional uh, perspective, I can provide then as well. In preparation for today's testimony, I did a bit of research just uh, very quickly with regards to the volume of expungements and sealings that we've seen over the last few years and thought that might be instructive to the committee today. In 2018, for the year, we processed 2,503 expungements uh, and sealings for the year uh, in VCIC for the year 2018, which averaged out to approximately 208 per month. Two years later in 2020, we processed 14,739 for an average of 1,228 per month. And that is with the disruptions that the coronavirus caused the last year. So far this year in 2021 through March, we've processed 3,401 with an average of 1,134 per month. So you can see even in a short period of time, just from 2018 to 2021, we've seen a significant increase in the number of expungements and ceilings that we're processing uh, every month. Uh, through this through this process. So I thought that might be instructive just to get a sense of, of scale uh, for the committee members to, to see what we're seeing in VCIC um, and what we're what we're working and processing on. Uh, we have one staff member who's dedicated to that and then a few other uh, staff that are working overtime on a federal grant to keep that up. So it's it's we're definitely doing it by the shoestrings to some degree to keep that moving forward. And then um, in terms of um qualifying offenses, can you, you know, is there a pattern or there's some more than others? Um, no, that's a great question, Representative. And I would say, um, I don't have a breakdown of, are they misdemeanors versus felonies versus drug crimes versus other types of crimes. In talking with staff, what we are seeing is an awful lot of cases that were deferred or dismissed that are now being formally expunged or removed from the record entirely. Uh, that has generated a lot of this volume uh, and where we didn't see that nearly as much in the past, those were allowed to stay as they had been. So that's probably one of the biggest single things that we can point to to say these deferreds and dismissed are being really aggressively expunged where they weren't necessarily even a few years ago uh, being handled in the same manner. Thank you, yeah, I was, I was wondering about, for instance, um, Things that are no longer crimes or cannabis or or things like that were um that was part of it okay uh thank you uh tom hey jeff how you doing um so you've got some federal money you said to help with uh expungement yes sir we do get a, a small amount of federal money to keep our criminal history records current Obviously that comes into play for a number of things to making sure if our records are current, that means when agencies around the country access them. And also here in Vermont, it provides better data, which just works to everyone's advantage, whether it be for a criminal case or for firearms, uh, for a firearm determination, et cetera, um, that is useful. So we do get a small amount of federal money every year that we're able to pay some of our staff some overtime to keep working on, this, on these expungements. So, so that's that's pretty much an ongoing year to year thing since since you've been uh, involved. Yes, sir. Over the last decade, that's been something that we've we've done. We've not had to leverage it quite the same way in the past because our numbers have been have been lower. But that's what we're leveraging this fund for uh, currently. Right. OK. And and I guess uh, how how far behind are you if you are as far as uh, getting the expungements done? That's a great question, a uh, great question. We typically process them. Our goal is to have them from when we receive them from the court, uh, which sometimes that happens the same day. Other times there can be a little bit of a lag when the court sends them over to us. Uh, we, we, we strive to have those processed within 30 days. Uh, and we typically do quicker than that. But 
given that volume that I was just describing, that's a lot to process even in a month uh, to go through, you know, 11 to 1200 expungements in a month. So, but we're, we're right now, right around 30 days from when we receive it. Okay. Okay. So you're, you're at your limit. <laughs> Yes, sir. Much. yes, as sir. far as your uh, and, and I don't remember, was it in statute to have it done at 30 days or that's a, a time frame that that you folks had set or or where did the 30 days come from? As far as I'm aware, that's an internal uh, goal for us, recognizing the importance of these, um, the number of things that, that flow from. them, So we want to get them and treat them with a priority as best we can. Um, so that's a, that's a metric and a benchmark that we set for ourselves. Right, right. And uh all right, that, that, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Barbara. Hello. Um, so, I, so I don't know if this question is one that makes sense, but what's the, do you know how many um, uh, files you have of crimes? Like what's the, your universe for these expungements? Because it'd be interesting to see, like, are these 1% of the files that, yeah. <laughs> and that's a great question, Representative. And I don't, candidly, I don't have a real good answer off the top of my head for that because there's so many different ways to slice this. Um, I often get asked how many Vermonters have a, have a criminal history record. And unfortunately, because we don't have a list of Vermonters, I can't give you a definitive answer you know, on that. We also have folks that were convicted here in Vermont that have moved out of state, that don't live here anymore and vice versa. So it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, you know, it's, not, it's, it's not one um, that I can give a simple answer to, but I, I will, um, the next time I'm chatting with Karen Gannett from the Crime Research Group, because they do more of that, that analysis and statistical right. research, to see what type of information they might have or what we could collaborate on to try to give some sense of what is the sense of scale here. And even, I, I'm not sure I even care about it being broken down. It's just hard to know how, like at some point, it seems like we're gonna not have that many more people to expunge. You know what I mean? Like there aren't that many people who commit the really serious, you know, the top 10 offenses. So like, again, you wouldn't know, like even if it's like hundreds of thousands or like. We, I, I will say representative, we have looked um, and I haven't updated this number in a little while. So it might be a little bit stale, but I think it gives a sense of scale based on your question. Right. Um, at one point we had over 230,000 individuals in our criminal history files, which went back to the beginning of time, you know, essentially. So back to the, some of them go back to the 20s and 30s. Those right, are unusual, right. but the 70s and 80s is when you really see records become more complete. Um, that You can't take that number and divide by the number of Vermonters because many of those individuals, unfortunately, have deceased. They no longer live here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, so um, some of them may have come from out from another state here and had some interaction with law enforcement, so they were arrested or fingerprinted. Um, but that is one number just to get a sense of scale of how many individuals we have um, roughly in our criminal history database. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, keep, go ahead. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other, oh, I'm sorry, Ken. And then uh, have... Good afternoon, Jeffrey. Um, so what I just heard, we still have a tremendous amount of expungements that are still coming our way, right? It yes, appears sir. that way. So with us doing all this, like I've always, I never thought we charged enough to, to uh, people that can afford this. Is this, um, is this adding uh, a lot of money to the taxpayers of, of Vermont right now? As far as like, are you are you requiring about like court fees that folks have to file for this, or I want to make sure I'm question. Have we added people to go and do this job? As far as staffing, no, we have not added any new staff um, to to process this work. So, 
But then again, if we didn't add, that means we probably had too many. We could have done away with somebody. Well, I would say uh, to your question, Representative, we've, we've, we've had a little bit candidly, a little bit of luck here. Um, when I came here almost 11 years ago, many of our records were paper. We literally got stacks of, of dispositions or convictions or non-convictions in the mail on green bar, you know, the wide green bar paper that we all remember from those printers. Since that time, we've moved a lot of our process to electronic. So our communications with the courts are much more electronic than they used to be. So we don't have people manually retyping data the way we used to. So fortunately, as we've seen these start to increase, we've been able to streamline some of our processes more efficiently. I'd like to get that 30 days down much to much below that, but we're not able to do that, obviously, with the limited staffing that we have. So. So, so just, uh, I see the commissioners here. Um, just to be clear, I'm okay with, with uh, some uh, expungement and I do think it adds to the workforce and there's a lot of good to it, but I, um, the cost the cost and what we're getting for it is always a concern with me. So I'll, I'll just hold off for right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I see. Tom and Barbara's hands. I'm not sure if they're from <laughs> before. Oh, okay. They were. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I think I think that that really summarizes um, the information that I had available, and I would certainly defer, of course, to the commissioner if he has any uh, more policy-driven uh, things to share with the committee or any questions that I can answer as he as he discusses or provides information. So thank you to the committee for the time. And for those of you I haven't seen in a while, nice to see some friendly faces. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And good, good to see you. Um, okay, Commissioner, welcome. Good to Thanks see for you. having me. Uh, apologies for the delay, Madam Chair. I was uh, in Senate uh, government operations and it ran uh, a little long. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, for the record, Mike Sherling, uh, Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, I think uh, Jeff is best suited to, to talk with you about the technical components of uh, how expungements are done. I, I asked to testify today just to, to briefly get on the record um, uh, to kind of urge a sort of a global look at this um, from uh, our perspective, and I, I know at least some in the judiciary share uh, these concerns, having chatted with them over the months and, and years, um, the system has become increasingly uh, complicated and fragmented relative to expungements and seals um, and what's covered and what's not covered. Uh, so I just wanted to touch base briefly and really talk more conceptually and sort of at a high level, a high policy level, um, to suggest that uh, it would be incredibly helpful for, I think, all of us in the criminal justice system to take a comprehensive look at this and try to simplify the system to the greatest extent possible. And I would offer that uh, the goals that have been enumerated over the years are, uh, I believe, the right ones, trying to ensure that people aren't dogged with criminal convictions over the long term, that they don't impact their, um, their employment uh, opportunities when it's not appropriate to impact their employment opportunities, uh, et cetera. But the, the, some of our other public policy goals are now crashing into um, expungements in particular. Some of the expungements are happening with such speed that we're within the civil statute of limitations. There are other legal proceedings and other things happening that make it difficult to um, respond to when a record has been eradicated. Um, and in some cases, uh, people who are uh, former defendants whose records have been expunged, if they don't have a copy of that, in the 21st century, finding a, a, a digital trail that someone was involved in something is pretty easy to do, especially if that thing is substantive. Uh, but unfortunately, if a record's been expunged, that may be the only uh, record of something that's found. And uh, a person uh, or a government agency doesn't have the ability to go back and under controlled circumstances uh, 
get a, an official copy of whatever it was that occurred so they can use it uh, in some cases in their own uh, defense to clear their name um, from something that may have been blown up uh, in the media or uh, taken on its own life on social media. Um, you know, the, if, if that's the only record of something, that's problematic. So what I'm, uh, that's a, a long introduction to stating um, what I think is a better policy construct. The concept of simply eradicating the record of something, an expungement, I believe is not a great piece of public policy, just eliminating the record, because it's eliminating the record of government action. And as I said, it's also eliminating a record that a person may actually have a need to access in the future. So what I'm here to advocate for is to A, simplify the system, B, stop the practice of uh, expunging records in totality, but seal records and perhaps even ex explore uh, expanding the circumstances under which a record could be sealed. And then also come up with a, a construct or a rubric for those records to be unsealed, either if the court needs them for something, if they're needed for litigation, or if a prior defendant actually needs that record to be unsealed, make a motion to the court so that they can get a copy of it so they can use it to defend themselves against misinformation or uh, components of information, uh, fragments of information that may be out there about something that they need to clear up with uh, another party. Um, that's uh, That would alleviate a variety of the um, issues that we're running into on now uh, an increasingly frequent basis um, relative to what we do with expungements themselves. So uh, what I've described to you is sort of an oversimplification of the concept, but uh, to reiterate, potentially widen the lane for what could be sealed give people more options, but move away from the practice of just basically destroying records. That's just not a great idea for a, a myriad of reasons. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I see Tom's hand. Go ahead, Tom. Thank you. How are you doing, Commissioner? Um, so did you say when uh, when you have records to expunge or seal, there's a timeline involved? Well, it's there there are a variety of different timelines. And because there are so many different avenues for expungement and seal now, they're very difficult to navigate. So if you're going to ask me a technical question, I'm not going to be able to answer it because it's too No, 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 just general, just a general question. Because where I'm going is, is uh, um, I'm assuming that you're bumping up against these timelines in some aspects, where wherever it may be. Uh, like, like I said, we don't need to get detailed. And so, I, if we add more expungements and don't make things simpler, are, are you going to start exceeding those timelines? And and uh, is there ramifications for that? Potentially, um, and, and Jeff would be better suited uh, to give you the operational impact and whether we're, we're going to miss deadlines based on the, uh, the volume of work. What I'm suggesting is a pivot uh, to a system where uh, we just seal off the, the record that the person was involved in a particular event. So let me give you an example. Um, I'll use myself as the example. Mike Sherling gets uh, arrested for disorderly conduct um, and uh, gets convicted. And then that record now is ordered uh, expunged. What we do is actually, uh, or what many agencies do is, is just that record then complete, gets completely destroyed. Um, that is often happening within the civil statute of limitations uh, for someone to, for the arrest, for me to sue the arresting agency uh, for excessive force, for example. So the record is eradicated. There's still the potential for legal proceedings. And there's no way for me as the plaintiff to access the record so that I can bring my civil suit. What I'm suggesting is seal the record, make it so, uh, have the statute say, if I'm asked, I don't have to 
uh, say that I was arrested for disorderly conduct. It's, it's a record that's sealed under this particular subsection, so I can lawfully say I don't have a record. But give me the option to petition the court, or I, I would also suggest there are instances where the court may want to unseal a record based on whatever rubric you develop uh, for records to be unsealed. I'm not going to uh, uh, try to hypothesize what all of them might be, but let's say there's five different reasons um, that you make a showing to the court to unseal the record. Those th that that's kind of the the general outline that I think would be a better approach to. Um, a, getting these records out of the way for people, but B, making sure that they're still accessible either to the person impacted or in other rare instances to, for the court to, to be able to reference for some other reason, whether it's litigation or, um, you know, we're, we're expunging records of fairly substantive events now. Uh, it would be interesting to explore a seal that is... Um, dependent only on the person not uh, having no recidivism in that particular category. So for example, if you're going to seal or what we currently call expunge an aggravated assault conviction, it's contingent upon you not having a probable cause finding for another aggravated assault. If you go and do another one, that should be reason for the prosecutor to be able to petition to have the prior record unsealed and used against you. Um, in a in a future sentencing. Yeah, yeah um, my main concern is, I mean, right now, you know, from, from what I'm hearing is, uh, you, you know, we've got it. We've got a gallon can that's full right now, and we're tr we're trying to jam another court into it, and and to and I don't I don't know what the cure is. I mean, I've been a fan of expungement right along, and probably always will be it's just just the way i feel about it but at some point uh um and and i think we're there was we're overloading the system as far as getting this getting the you know the the paperwork or the process or whatever you want to call it done and uh and, and something's got to change your, to use your analogy sir uh, we could probably fit more in the can if we had a better funnel so if we improve the system if we simplify the system Using the suggestions that I've made, or there's probably a uh, hundred other ways to do it. Um, if we simplify the system, we can have more throughput and we can fill the can faster. But, yeah, and, and empty it, empty it and, faster. Also, and, and yeah. empty it faster. But I know yeah. where you're going. I know what you mean. <laughs> so, all right, great, thank you. I should be clear. You know, these instances where. Um, a, a sealed record would have to be unsealed are probably pretty rare, but they're incredibly impactful when they're needed. Um, it, we've had, I've only been in public safety for what, 19 months or so, 20 months, feels like forever with COVID. But there have been a few instances that have come by where there are expunged records and it's a head scratcher where, where there are other legal matters that we're uh, involved in and the the record's been expunged. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, you make a, uh, you make a lot of good points. Um, so so I've you know, I've been I, I've I've had some of the same concerns that you're expressing today, and 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 I've I've always. Uh, gone towards the balance of of wanting to clear individuals' records, and that's just kind of been the way we've been doing expungement. And um, but but as far as as far as records being ultimately deleted, I mean, we've been going down this road now for several years, and and, and I've uh, constantly tried to raise some questions about whether sealing is just uh, is sufficient, and and did when I was uh, part of the. Uh, sentencing commission's subcommittee that looked at expungements and 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 didn't agree with everything that the committee went or that subcommittee did, but ultimately that's where they headed. And really, I think it's important to clear individuals' records. But I think it does. I think we do need to keep on looking at whether sealing is sufficient, uh, and and that does take a lot of burden off the courts. Uh, it does preserve the records for uh, for future uses that, however narrow those could be, 
uh, and and, and it would allow us to proceed uh, with individuals being able to say they don't have a record because they still have the ability to say that. So, I, but there's still been pushed back a lot as far as no, we want to see the records deleted. I don't necessarily agree with that. As far as the simplifying component, um, I, I know that you're, I think on the sentencing commission, uh, but haven't, uh, haven't been on the subcommittee looking at uh, the whole recategorization of the criminal code. And, and I've mentioned that to the subcommittee on expungement and they recognize this as well, that we do have a path for simplifying this. Uh, if we simplify the criminal code with the different categories of crimes, there can be a relatively straightforward expungement associated with the different categories, you know, uh, class A through uh, E, uh, crimes for misdemeanors and maybe expungement can be also on felonies class D and E. In any event, there's a, there's a way for that, I think. But there is a question coming here. I guess you know, I wouldn't mind you commenting on, on how or if you've thought about how this, what you're thinking would fit into this restructuring of the criminal code. So that's, that's one question I have. But the other one is just if you have any in the shorter term, because that's obviously a little longer term, I'm hoping by the next, by the end of next session, we actually will have that in place, but that depends a lot on our sister body down the vir virtual stairs. Um, the other question I would have, and I'll just throw both those questions out for you is in the short term, if you actually have any suggestions or if you have any folks who have, you know, the detailed suggestions of what could be done with the bill that we have now before us, uh, to, uh, to address those issues you've just raised. So uh, thanks for uh, both the commentary and the question. Uh, working backwards, I don't have specific suggestions on the bill, though, uh, if we could carve out some time, I may be able to, to make some. Um, my participation in the Sentencing Commission has been limited through COVID because we've been immersed in the, uh, in the emergency response. Um, but we now have uh, our Assistant General Counsel's uh, been attending for the last couple of months. Um, relative to the questions around um, the, the restructuring the criminal code, I hadn't contemplated this in relation to that, but I think your observation is correct, sir, that uh, it would make it a um, relatively streamlined process to set up a, uh, uh, the parameters under which seals uh, could occur or the types of offenses that could be sealed. Um, as a uh, as an outgrowth of that, um, the and then the other half of that question I think was is there is there an approach um, now um, and I, I would sort of use the same construct that is contemplated with the um, the stratification of offenses um, that the sentencing commission is working on and it, I think one of the advantages. Um, of the uh, the idea of moving to seals from expungement is you could actually allow for more records to get uh, sealed because the some of the ancillary concerns around um, them being foundational to future you know significant prosecutions um, could be obviated because if the court has the ability to if they're conditional seals based on no reoffense for a similar kind of thing you. It, there's there's no downside risk to the state um, and to the public if it can be used in a future prosecution if there's a reoffense. Um, but it's there's a huge advantage to the defendant if it's their only aggravated assault conviction, for example, getting that uh, to go away uh, or get out of public view quicker. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it would be relatively easy if we were to. Uh, to to pivot the attention to something like what I've described to carve out the uh, array of offenses that are subject to sealing and on what uh, timelines. Uh, I think the more nuanced and potentially uh, harder needle to thread because there'll be more um, um, voices with ideas on how to do it is under what circumstances uh, a seal could be lifted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Hello, Commissioner. So 
I'm detecting that you're not the biggest fan of expungement for a few reasons. Um, and it seems like your suggestion of sealing is very different than expungement because in some cases, I think our goal is to wipe out the person's, like give the person that fresh start. So yeah, it wouldn't show up a few years later in court. And I mean, that's one of the, the policy issues I think the legislature has to grapple with. But those sealed records could, could be subpoenaed or turned over um, in ways that an expunged record couldn't. So, I mean, perhaps the person whose record is being expunged could get a certificate um, that they could use if they have to show it. I think we heard the military sometimes needs to know that it, that it was cleared. But like so many states are expunging and have worked it out. And I have not seen the data go up on um, crime. So, so I think we, at least I was envisioning expungement is they have paid their debt to society and we are prepared to wipe the slate clean for them. Um, I was just reading that in some cases, the major companies that do background checks for most employers don't use really updated um, databases. And so at times they're telling somebody that somebody has a record. And um, this other state was saying, then you've got to take action under the fair, um, the fair credit rating laws. So as it is, I, I worry about, you mentioned social media and you know how that gets out there, but, um, but, I, but I think really sealing is a different beast and, um, and we have to, if we're deciding that we're going the sealing route, we can't say it's really expungement, but it's sealed, right? It's different. In some states, um... What we call expungement, uh, what they call expungement is what we call a seal. So when, when you look state to state, uh, I think it's important to look at the nuances of how they execute their policy. Um, I don't have a list offhand of who does uh, which and how. Um, and and I, 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 I'm, I, I think my sense of the policy goals are the same as, as yours, Representative. I, I do think there are many instances where uh, people's missteps should be in the rear view mirror permanently. But I do think there's a way to do that um, using a, uh, a seal of some sort. And, and you know, you can define exactly what that means. Um, perhaps it is, you're actually eradicating their name from the record itself, but you're keeping the record. But then there is, uh, you know, we do this with data sometimes, there's a pointer to uh, Barbara Rachelson's uh, record that can be unlocked by the court. So they know that this fact pattern and this affidavit and this case file goes with that in the event that either you needed it or under whatever other circumstances the legislature saw fit to, to allow something to be unsealed. And maybe for many things, you know, misdemeanor drug possession, uh, disorderly conduct is probably a bad example, uh, driving with a suspended license. Those are all things that may they just, they can't be unsealed. There's, there's very little reason to ever go back and unseal them. Um, other than if the defendant needed them for something or, or needed, uh, they were needed for some other litigation that the court needed to, to look at them. Um, so uh, I, I, I think some of it's semantic, but uh, I think your, your policy goal is, um, is aligned with ours that, you know, we, we don't want people to be dogged with especially low level things uh, in perpetuity. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ken. I think what I'm hearing is uh, we're having a situation where we've had expungement with some people and they're re-offending again and we can't fall back 
on previous charges to do more. Basically, reoffending is what I'm saying. Uh, right? That's that's one piece of my concern. I, I wouldn't overstate that. I, I don't think that's happening with with tremendous frequency, but there could be low numbers of high impact instances of that that would be important to I think in the to be able to to pierce that veil of of seal, pierce the seal if we were to go to sealed records versus expungement. Right now, there is no way to, to pierce an expungement. Once it's expunged, it's gone. And uh, my larger concerns are um, other legal proceedings where you don't have access to it um, and an increasing number of instances where we're, uh, we're coming across people in background investigations or uh, uh, people want a copy of something and it doesn't exist anymore. Okay, I, I'm not experienced enough in this to, to know. Like, like, can you give me a uh, for instance, or, or is that not yes. allowed? Yes, uh, a, a, a law enforcement organization in Vermont was doing a background investigation uh, on an executive level person from an out of state. This is it's an out of state example, but it, it is on on target. Um, the uh, internet searches found. Um, a number of things, more than one thing that uh, indicated that there were case files that would shed light on the person's character. Those case files were inaccessible because they had been uh, expunged. And, and as a result, we we're unable to actually clear the person of um, character flaws that might have otherwise allowed them to be hired into a job. So what you're saying is we should be thinking about doing a lot more sealing, less expungement in case it's ever needed in the future for better public safety. Yeah, it, that's exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm, so, so, uh, I'm gonna use two examples um, that, well, one has actually happened and one hasn't yet, but. You know, the two things that are at the top of mind for law enforcement right now uh, are um, bias-free policing and uh, use of force. And right now, we could have an instance where um, force was used or a, uh, uh, either we want to be able to unpack something that's statistically significant because we're dealing with a, per, a, a person of color um, or uh, the agency is accused of uh, doing something that is, uh, is out of bounds. And the record in either one of those instances may be expunged and unable to be used to better illuminate uh, the propriety of use of force or, um, or bias-free policing or something else, in, or just our ability to analyze those things as we're unpacking them because that record is, uh, is, no longer exists. It's, I mean, look, put fundamentally, we're, cra we're crashing together two um, sort of top level policy goals. Uh, one is we want people to be able to get out from under criminal convictions, but the other is government transparency. We're eradicating the record of government action. Now, I'm not arguing against the ability to eradicate the record that you interacted with Mike Schnerling in that disorderly conduct on April 13th, 2021, but we're simultaneously getting rid of a record of, of what the government did. That is, just strikes me as not a great idea in the 21st century. So it, it seems like what we... Um... I don't think it's that complicated. It, it's complicated now in my thinking because it's coming at me, but I'm not surprised I'm hearing this. But it shouldn't be that hard to make adjustments. So it's better, I'm going to use the word policing, but it's a better uh, course of action because I can't think of the word. Uh, for uh, everybody, um, for better protection for all, and also give people 
uh, another chance at at having uh, a new start in life. I think executed properly, it can achieve all of those goals. And as I indicated earlier, I think if a move to the type of system that I'm describing would actually allow a wider and faster lane for more people to get their record sealed. Yes, I hear you. Thank you, sir. Um, Barbara, I'm gonna assume your hands are <laughs> Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Uh, not seeing any other hands. Let's give folks a minute. Okay. Well, thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. It, it certainly would be helpful to, um, to highlight where in, in the bill you'd make changes, what type of amendments you would be looking for. Um, so something concrete uh, that, that we could respond to, um, so. We will take a look at that. I appreciate you uh, in, indulging the sort of broader policy conversation and the bill, uh, direct bill testimony. Sure, thank you. Uh, I do see Kate's hand up, go ahead, Kate. Thanks, yeah, just <clears throat> reflecting on, on your thoughts. I guess I'm curious, so my understanding is that with sealing, um, the information is no longer accessible to the public, but it is accessible within the court system. And so I guess my first question is, I'm, I'm curious, my concern would be if we are talking about hypothetically turning more towards sealing versus expungement, um, we're still at the mercy of the court system having access to information that could then be used to impact sentencing or other issues like that. And so I'm curious, I guess, first, if you're advocating for this type of expansion, how would you advocate addressing that issue so that we aren't continuing to exacerbate inequities within the court system? That's a great question. Uh, I think the concept is that there could be multiple levels of sealing. So there are uh, a sealed record um, could be uh, similar to a current sealed record where the court can see it for a period of time. Um, uh, a second level seal would be um, it's sealed, it's there, but the, the virtual file folder can't be opened unless one of whatever the criteria you set uh, exists. Petition by the defendant, um, uh, like offense, probable cause is found for certain types of offenses, again, for the more serious things, not for the, the low level um, types of offenses uh, and things of that nature. So just sort of laying out exactly what you're describing under what circumstances is it uh, sealed but visible in other circumstances, is it sealed not visible and can only be opened under whatever the uh, uh, conditions that are set in statute say. Thanks. And I guess the other what is that, comment or question, I think some of the examples you're using as to why we might want to consider sealing over expungement seem to be framing it as supporting folks who have been charged in the past. So like providing greater transparency, providing their access to their own records so that if they wanted or needed to, they could hold the government accountable, um, sort of framing it as though this kind of move is really for the betterment of the folks who historically have been most impacted by the criminal justice system. And I, I guess I just find it interesting that, or, or maybe curious that I'm not hearing activists or, or advocates advocate for this. You know, I'm hearing you advocate for it from the Department of Public Safety. And so I, I, again, I don't know if that's just a comment or a question. I feel like if this, obviously, if this were a thing we were gonna pursue, I, I would hope and imagine we would also be seeking input from folks who are most impacted by policies like this. Um, so I guess maybe in, in a question around that is, you're sort of naming these hypothetical situations of people who might be better served through um, sealing, is there, is this just anecdotal? Like, is there evidence to suggest that this is an actual 
problem that's arising or, or where is this coming from? Um, almost all of the examples I've given you are real world examples that I've experienced since I've been at public safety. Um, and I'm not familiar with all of the uh, public records requests that come in. So it's only a cross section. Um, it's, these are not, nothing I'm describing is going to be high frequency. Uh, but all of them could potentially be high impact. They could be things where people are going for jobs. They could be, again, uh, they're often going to intersect the legal system in one form or another. Um, so as uh, it, it, the other thing, uh, the other example I gave, and I probably wasn't, um, I know I wasn't particularly detailed about it, but uh, as we're doing qualitative analysis of either use of force or bias-free policing, there's an advantage to being able to go into that particular record and see the details of what happened so that we can better understand how to improve operations. So from an, a, an operational government um, perspective, as we're doing, a, let's say, a three-year retrospective on use of force uh, of people of color, that would be a total of about 60 events uh, over a three-year period. We're fortunate in Vermont that we could actually read each one of them. But if it's sealed, we lose a cross section of, um, of those events that we're able to review and try to come up with uh, policy alterations and, and areas for improvement. Again, I don't wanna overstate it. These are low frequency uh, things, but they are impactful things. Thank you. Uh, Coach and then Martin. Commissioner, how are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. I left you a voicemail this morning. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that. Uh, you and about 20 other people, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, we are working on it. Um, a question that comes to mind, um, thinking about you know all of the potential options does anybody have an idea um, what the statute of limitation is, you know, in a situation where, let's say, a defendant, you know, is or her record is expunged and then along the way something else occurs and access to uh, that record m might uh, result in a civil suit regarding like a defamation or uh, not being able to get, you know, that job um, because someone bought up the case, even though the records were expunged, they might have found information from another source, you know, let's say you know, the newspapers or some ar other archival data. Um, knowing that the actual court record or legal documents are the truly verifiable docs. Uh, so the question is the statute of limitation. On the on civil side of things, uh, I would cross this with legislative counsel and, and other attorneys because I am not one, but uh, three years for the majority of things. And uh, there are some things that are seven years. Uh, although you're contemplating, um, uh, if it hasn't already passed, uh, removing civil statutes of limitations for uh, accountability on, for example, sex crime, which actually brings up another again, rare, uh, incredibly rare, but potentially um, significantly impactful um, reason to not eradicate a record. Uh, it is not uncommon in major cases, especially ones that are old, to have old records um, have a, a notable impact on an investigation and potentially on a civil case uh, one for which there wasn't a statute of limitation. So for example, that, that disorderly conduct I've used as the hypothetical, um, that event could conceivably be a placeholder or a fragment of information in a larger course of conduct, larger intersection of a relationship with someone 
that someone decides to bring a civil action 20 years from now and that placeholder is now gone and that record of that interaction is now gone because there's no way to pierce the veil of expungement because there isn't one. So again, it's, it, it, it's not gonna happen every day. It might happen once a year, might happen once a decade, but it's another reason not to uh, have a public policy where we eradicate records. And and I guess the other the other follow up question is, uh, does anyone? And I know you've been looking at a lot of modernization uh, uh, functionalities within DSP. Um, what is the the cloud access cost? You know, for you know some of these ex extended uh, sizes of files. Um, uh, you know, we pay in the hundreds of thousands, low hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for video storage across the entire footprint of the state police, which is a lot of video um, on a rolling basis. So it's not, it might sound like a lot of money, but it's not particularly expensive and it's coming down. Um, and relative to cloud storage for our, and that's the most expensive version, um, for our uh, records databases, um, you know, they're, they're uh, terabytes and growing and it's not a significant uh, expense. Thank you. And I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Martin. Yeah, so here, uh, here's my question. So there, there are a number of crimes that are not expungible at this point. Uh, they're, they're, they're violent crimes or crimes against people. I guess a, a question for you, and I'm not looking for you to answer it immediately, but if we went to a ceiling, uh, to a situation where we're doing ceiling as opposed to actually destroying the records, I, is the administration, is DPS open to expanding uh, the ability to seal uh, records for some of these violent crimes. You know, it may, it may be, you know, th these are some crimes that might have 10, 15, 20 year uh, sentences. I mean, these are very serious crimes, but of course, after the person who commits such a crime in their early 20s and serves 10 or 15 years and is in their mid 30s, they are still uh, bound to that criminal record for years, decades. Uh, Yes, to allow, the, you know, to so, allow somebody in that situation, maybe it's maybe it's a long period of time between the end of the sentence to being sealable. But would would there be an, a willingness to say, all right, well, if we're doing it, it where we're sealing, where we can get back to that document, if 40 years later, this person commits another violent offense, we can look at it for sentencing purposes. And is, is that somewhere where the administration would go? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, conditional on the kinds of things that you mentioned, like what's the time frame and um, you know what's the totality of circumstances at a single offense or was this a course of conduct that went on for a, a long period of time? But yeah, the answer is yes. Pe uh, no, <laughs> I was uh, in part in jest, but it's it's actually true. Uh, the the two biggest indicators of crime are the age of uh, of people and uh, in the weather, the hotter weather, molecules move faster, uh, more violent crime tends to happen. Um, so it, it, in the, the instance that you described, you know, somebody does something significant, they are, uh, they serve a lengthy sentence and then, you know, they go a few years and they're not on the radar at all. They're just, they're, they're a, um, a fully functioning member of society they should be able to get that record sealed. Right. Because I, I see that as one of the major selling points for going to a sealing situation, because in my dealing with this for the last five, six years, there's been absolutely no way are we going to go to a point where we are, uh, you know, expunging uh, some of these violent crimes. Uh, so yeah, I think most sex crimes are going to be a little bit of a challenge because of the nature of offenses. Um, on the property crime side, uh, you know, the one that stands out is embezzlement. 
um, because it tends to be a repetitive offense. Um, and you want people to be able to make conscious hiring decisions and not put someone in a position where they set themselves up for failure in the future. But I, I think they're more the exception than the rule. If people actually rehabilitate themselves in the vast majority of circumstances, they ought to have the ability to, to have a shot at a seal. And then, I mean, this is, it's a, it's a tough conversation. I mean, we're, we're talking about the easy ones, perhaps, and these are not at all easy, stalking, domestic assault. Well, if somebody is, is imprisoned for stalking or domestic assault for five, 10 years, should they have the rest of their life, the, the uh, other obstacles that a criminal record presents? Or should they have some ability to stay clean or be good for 10 years or whatever, and then have the document sealed? Although it's still there, if something comes up down the road. So I, I'm sorry that, that I'm, I'm preaching right there instead of asking you a question. I apologize, but I think no. That, but it, it's a it's a good point. And you know, th those kinds of offenses, um, you know, sexual violence offenses, have a different offender profile and a different type of motivation behind <laughs> what causes uh, those cycles of violence. Um, so it's just going to be important to keep those in mind as we try to create. Uh, the roadmap to how to get one of those records sealed. It'll just have to be done. Uh, if we choose to entertain that, it'll have to be done cautiously so we don't un inadvertently create a chain of additional victimization. Right, right. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. This is helpful in terms of considering this bill and path forward. Uh, Thank you. Other questions. Um, okay, so um, we're over time, but we do have the Attorney General's office here. So I would like to hear from David Chair, please. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll try to be fairly quick. I, I wanted to make four points. Um, a couple responsive to actually the Department of Corrections uh, points last week, and then some that I think are just more, have been generally discussed um, throughout the testimony and that I hope all four will be helpful to the committee as you consider the bills and the issues it presents. Um, one of the points that was discussed last week was the potential for offenses to be expunged while somebody is under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. In other words, some other offense, not the one that they're under supervision for, uh, gets expunged. Um, and that then could change their operations, change the way they are able to assess risk, deal with somebody who's under their supervision and so forth. I wanna emphasize that the bill is constructed to prevent that for the most part. When you read through the provisions of the bill, it does say that uh, you know, the expungement can only happen if the sentence being served for a subsequent offense is already completed. So somebody should or is required really to be out of the supervision of the Department of Corrections before the expungement can occur. I will acknowledge that it is possible for this to happen. One of the ways that it is possible for it to happen is if the respondent, either the state's attorney or the attorney general's office, decides to uh, waive the time period for the expungement. And so that does mean that it, the effect of that could be that somebody ends up getting the expungement before the, um, you, you know, while they're still under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. I'd say a couple things to that. One, it, I mean, I'll acknowledge it sounds like the Department of Corrections did have a specific case they were thinking about when they made that uh, statement. I don't know that case particularly. I do think that that's a very unusual circumstance. It's certainly our, it's our practice, and I think it's most offices' practices when they're looking at expungements uh, to see if somebody is still under sentence. Uh, certainly um, we do waive the timelines, uh, but we, all, we also always check. Uh, and that would be a reason not to waive a timeline in a particular case for our office, but it could happen. Um, well, I wanna throw out a suggestion. I'm not necessarily a proponent of this suggestion, but if it is a concern for the committee or if the committee feels like this is an issue that would be good to have addressed before moving the bill further for whatever reason, you know, it could actually be a fairly simple legal fix to sort of take that problem off the table. And that would simply be to say that notwithstanding any other provision of the expungement statutes, uh, no offense will be expunged if somebody is currently under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. 
that would still allow the timelines to be waived in many cases. You know, somebody has been good, no further offenses, state's attorney, attorney general can waive the timeline. Uh, that would still be available, but it would mean that that, one, that problem would uh, not exist anymore. And I, and I also, again, for the same reason that I don't think this is happening very often, I think this is unusual, um, in part because the legal construct prevents it from happening in most cases. Um, I, I think that could be a solution that would sort of take that problem off the table without actually affecting that many cases. So just wanted to, as we're thinking through the problems, wanted to present that as a possible solution. And another point that I wanted to discuss briefly is this concern around um, risk assessments and whether or not uh, do, does the practice of expungement uh, make risk assessment less accurate down the road. And, you know, I think that if you were going to take that argument seriously, it would be an argument against all expungement ever happening. And that's certainly not an argument that I would, or that our office is, is one that we would accept or one that we think that this uh, inevitably leads to. It's important to remember some of the data that underlies in some of the studies that underlie our uh, you know, proponency of these of these uh, policy concepts, which is that the studies do show that after about seven years or so, even for fairly serious offenses, and I've already testified to this, just as a reminder, uh, the some risk of somebody's reoffense goes down to that of the general population. So even if there were to be a risk assessment many years down the road, and remember these timelines are not short, uh, <laughs> for especially for the more serious offenses, are, we're talking about the eligibility for expungement doesn't come in for quite a number of years. It's the ceiling that happens first. Um, so it's going to be available anyway, even to the extent that it's not available. That earlier offense, if the risk assessment is accurate, should not be really weighting it at all. Uh, so even if it were available, that shouldn't be taken into consideration by whatever risk assessment tool is being used because the data shows that that doesn't really contribute to a risk factor after X number of years, um, or I shouldn't say X, you know, seven or more years, even for more uh, serious offenses. So I think that's an important thing to keep in mind that this notion that prior offenses always are indicators of risk, I think is statistically false. And for that reason, we shouldn't be holding on to them forever, nor should we sort of design around future risk assessments forever. The statute already has fairly long timelines, then those are in place for the exact reason that if something does happen in the future, you can take it into account. Uh, but after a while, it's really not indicative of risk. And for that reason, the proposal is there to allow for expungement. And again, it's one we uh, have been in favor of and continue to be in favor of. Uh, a third point I wanted to talk about, I know there's been some discussion and the commissioner talked about this a bit too, just more broadly about um, how we deal with expungement. What is the extent of it? Uh, what does it mean exactly? How, um, how, how much, are, to what extent are the records being completely eliminated? Um, and what is the administrative burden in doing so? And the issue of data retention and so on and so forth. One thing to keep in mind is that this statute as it's proposed opens the door in the short term to a bunch of ceiling. It actually doesn't open the door in the short term to a bunch of expungements. Uh, the, the current regime will stay in place, of course, and so those expungements are available now and will continue to be available. Uh, but in terms of the new crimes that are being, the, for which the door is being opened, uh, it's only ceiling that it's gonna happen initially. So, and I should say, and the statute provides for the Sentencing Commission to really dig down into some of these other issues as we've, as we've already discussed around, um, streamlining the process, uh, how we can make it smoother, what is expungement and ceiling really going to mean in the future. Um, so I don't think that you are, by passing this, eliminating or creating, eliminating the possibility of reforms that can address some of those things. Uh, and, you know, the initial things are only going to be ceiling that happens. So the data is still going to be there. It's not an irreversible step, at least in the short term. And, and, the, and I think it's, 
it's but it's also a very important step for the people who um, are going to have that ceiling available to them where they which it isn't now and one that we do think the legislature should take so just wanted to remind the committee of that that there is actually in some ways not an irrevocable step being taken there's an advantage being granted and so which people should get and some of these other issues I think can be discussed and I actually think that there's some broad agreement coming from a number of angles on ways or on the fact that there should be some improvements and streamlining being made. Um, the preservation of data issue, I think, is a valid one. It's one that the Crime Research Group has discussed as well, and um, one that we're happy to think about how to work on. I don't actually think it may not even be that complex because the judiciary is already keeping an index, and we just have to think about how to anonymize that adequately. But again, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, just to point out that um, there's some valid points being made here, but ones that I don't think this bill sort of irrevocably damages in terms of being able to deal with them as we move forward and the mechanisms already in place in the bill to deal with them. The final piece I just wanted to mention was with respect to resources and burden. It's always been our position that uh, expungements are very important. And if we put in resources to convicting people and to sort of pulling people into the criminal system, we should also be dedicating resources to allowing people to escape from consequences of that once they've already paid their debt and have proven to be uh, on, on a good road and, and not, uh, not getting involved in any more harmful behaviors. Um, that being said, I also think that, you know, there will be an increased burden from this. Uh, but there will also be, and I, but I also want to emphasize that part of the burden that's being created is by the statutes the legislature passed to deal with the uh, COVID-19 crisis, um, which put off the final uh, adjudication of expungements for, uh, I think is 120 days after the end of the executive order. And for that reason, our office really does think it's valid and appropriate to use some one-time funds uh, from the recovery funds to um, to deal with the bubble that will very likely come through the system because it's a bubble that has in part been created by the uh, COVID crisis. And uh, for that reason, we think that's appropriate and it, and it should be some, it would be reasonable to dedicate some resources to this uh, just as resources are being dedicated for all sorts of issues uh, stemming from the crisis. So those are the four points I wanted to make responsive to some of the stuff that's been heard. I realize I, I talked maybe too quickly and there's probably a bunch of questions and we're near the end of the day, but I'm happy to answer what I can now or come back uh, at a future date and answer some more. Thank you, David. That was, that was very helpful. Uh, Ken. Uh, just to clarify what I think I heard, I think you said we pull people into the criminal system. We don't, I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry, finish your question. My apologies. I didn't know we pulled people in the criminal system. I thought people do crimes and they get themselves in the criminal system and then we're trying to work with them to fix their mess up. Certainly we, certainly we try to work with them to fix uh, mess ups or to prevent, you know, prevent further harm or to uh, punish for harm that's happened. I don't mean to indicate differently. But, um, but you know, it's also, I don't wanna sit here and say that all the enforcement happens completely evenly uh, in all situations. I think the government does make choices sometimes which affect some people more harshly than others. Uh, so I, there are choices being made on the government side as well. But of course, I think you're right. It, it's true that um, people make bad choices and, and we have to respond to that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh... Coach, I think your hand is, is it up from before? Do you have a question? Sorry, it was uh, from the other hand. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, David. That was helpful. Uh, certainly, we need to have some more discussion on this committee. Uh, looking at the hour, though. Um, so we will adjourn for today.